Thanks, fans. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, th thanks for the introduction. Um, again, my name is Patrick Schuff, and um, today I will be um, sharing, hopefully, a, a useful kind of a, a story or analogy of, of how the internet works um, and how the internet sometimes doesn't work. And um, this is my, I believe, fourth time uh, speaking at OLF. I look forward to it every year, and I'm really, you know, happy that the team was able to, you know, put this together. It's it's really great, and uh, really really looking forward to it. So. Um, so, you know, with that, um, I will uh, just kind of dive in and, and, and we'll go through it. So, whoops, here we go. Um, so I, I did have a really cool uh, video to show here, but it doesn't look like my internet's working. Uh, this is a joke where if I was a live audience, everybody go crazy and hoot and holler, but um, here we are. So, so who am I and why, you know, do I, you know, why am I up here talking about the internet? So I'm gonna give a, kind of a brief introduction um, to myself. I've been very fortunate to, um, to, to one, have um, grown up around computers uh, for much of my life. I, my first computer was a Commodore 64, long, long time ago. Um, so I've just always kind of had computers around. And um, with that, um, in my career, um, both here in, in Ohio and Columbus, and, and I also um, spent a few years at um, two really big tech companies who combined or even just uh, separately, they comprise a really sizable portion of the internet traffic uh, and you know, the bits delivered over the internet at any, on any given day. So um, kind of fast forward to 2006, um, I joined uh, Ohio State uh, as a, uh, an undergraduate in the computer science and, and engineering. So having grown up around computers for a long time, I really, uh, you know, I kind of knew I was going to go into computers in some capacity and CSE just kind of made the most sense uh, in terms of kind of a mixture of theory and actual practical application. And it was in 2006, and I'll, I'll, I'll wait till the end to share my first experience with Linux, um, so I remember it well. Um, about 2006 is when I really started using Linux for the first time. And um, it was actually, uh, I, I, I kind of kind of fell into it um, because it was really, really frustrating for me. And I was completely on Windows at the time, but um, it was so frustrating that I just decided to wipe every system I had from Windows and go to Linux. And, you know, fast forward 15 plus, you know, almost 15 years later, it actually ended up being a really amazing career move for me. Um, also while in school, uh, I learned about Python. So that's, you know, I, I never really started coding um, in, a, in a real way until college. And it really wasn't until I learned Python that the world really opened up for me and things that I wanted to build and problems I needed solved. The Python language helped me do that. Um, so I really, you know, I, I think like the late 2000s were really where um, I, 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 I I, I kind of, I guess, progressed in, in, in my career in a big way. And I want to add to, I was a very, very average um, student. Like I did the things I needed to get done, but I was much more interested in building things outside of the classroom. And that's really where kind of the roots of my Linux and, and, and software engineering background kind of stem from. So following college, um, again, I was using Linux and I was using it full time um, all throughout school. And in 2011, I joined my uh, first full time um, company or my first full-time job was with Nationwide Insurance on the Linux team. So we were essentially doing a lot of system administration work. And at the same time, I was able to automate a lot of the annoying repetitive things um, that, you know, is involved in, in sysadmin. So doing a lot of Linux um, and, you know, kind of, we had a few thousand servers that we managed at the time. And it was, you know, really great for me to kind of apply all the things that I'd done previously in school, you know, at home to, you know, real world situations. I'm only going to make one political statement um, throughout this whole presentation, and it's with uh, this slide here. Um, I um, I really prefer Emacs, so I'm I, I, I'm I'm Emacs over Vim. Um, I actually, you know, as a sysadmin, if you're really a good sysadmin, you have to use Vim all the time. So still use Vim all the time, but um, Emacs is is uh, the editor that I prefer. Um, I will say these days I do use VS Code, but still have the Emacs key bindings. Cool. So. Um, and nationwide, it was, uh, I was really uh, pretty happy there. I was working there about a year and a half and I got hit up by a recruiter on LinkedIn um, from Facebook who asked me if I wanted to um, interview with them. So at the time, I didn't think I had a chance of getting a gig with them, um, but fast forward two phone interviews, one flight out to Menlo Park and five grueling onsite interviews later, I ended up getting a job full-time uh, with Facebook. 
So um, my uh, my fiance and now wife at the time, uh, or my now wife, uh, made the trek from Ohio to California. So I joined a team called the Global Site Reliability Team. And um, again, like I really, my background, I consider myself a Python and Linux person. Like I'm kind of sysadmin, you know, I have the Python knowledge. But um, in this role, we managed, um, I traded in a few thousand Linux servers at Nationwide to a few hundred thousand Linux servers at Facebook. So, you know, we were managing the global site. We didn't really own anything in, except the general reliability of Facebook. So um, I not only got exposed to really big distributed systems, um, which was a really great experience, but um, I also, what more importantly, and where I've learned way more in my career and any role that I've ever had is I got to see how things break. We were literally the 24 seven break fix team who had coverage here in the United States and also in Dublin, Ireland, who were involved in every single outage. So seeing distributed systems, how they're built and seeing how they break really, um, you know, it, it puts an impression on you and it makes you, gives you a really good insight into how to build things and, and how not to build things. So one of the, um, I think one of the main goals of any engineer in any role that you're in is your job is to automate yourself out of your job. Like you should, you know, replace yourself with ideally code and then you can go move on to bigger, better problems. And a year and a half into Facebook, that's actually exactly what my team did. Um, we had about 20 engineers in the team where we were doing like literally, and this is crazy to think about even in 2012, but we were doing database migrations and like for, for, you know, for Facebook. And we ended up automating all those things away and building systems to, to, to do that job. So that team actually dissolved and we got to go figure out where we wanted to, to, to go. And one of the areas that I thought was really interesting that I had very little in, um, knowledge of at the time was networking. And specifically, like, how does the internet work? How do people get to Facebook? And one of the really cool things that they had um, is, and it still exists to some extent today, is uh, you could actually send people from Facebook and from one continent and move them to an entire another continent by editing one line in a single file. And that was kind of fascinating to me. I needed, to, I wanted to know how it works. So I ended up joining the traffic and CDN team. So their job is to make sure no matter where you are in the world, whether you use Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, et cetera, um, when you use those apps, we know we detect where you are in the world, and that's not based on GPS location. Those don't matter at all. We base that based on the internet and where you're at located within the internet. So um, I ended up joining that team for a, a couple years, and um, we ended up helping build out the global internet infrastructure and photo and video delivery uh, systems on that team. So. If in the last eight or nine years, you've ever seen any of these memes on Facebook and they got delivered to your phone or your website or your, your browser really fast, um, you're welcome. Um, I, 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 some of the teams that I, that I worked on, um, you know, built those systems to, to make sure that delivery was really quickly. So um, the last team I worked on at Facebook was um, the disaster recovery team. Uh, so when you work on a site that big and you have a global presence as they do, um, one of the things that you need to think about is, and you, and you have a multi data center kind of region or you know, multi data center system, sorry, website, um, you need to think about disaster recovery. And one of the things that has happened many times is you know, big hurricanes have come through and um, you know, can wipe out an entire region, you know, an entire East Coast. So I was on a team that we would go and simulate those types of events and uh, make sure that Facebook stayed up. Cool. So going to 2018, um, I had a, my wife and I had a child in California, which set in motion um, our want to move back to Ohio. So um, at the time, I was trying to move back to uh, with Facebook um, to, to to work remote, which um, it didn't end up working out that way. Which is which is kind of ironic because now they're um, they want to lead the uh, the remote workplace, um, I guess, in the industry, which is actually really cool. Um, but uh, since I wasn't able to do that with uh, Facebook, I ended up uh, deciding to join Netflix. So I joined their site reliability engineering team to, and which allowed me to move back to Ohio and work um, for them um, and, uh, and work on their video delivery team. So many of the things I was doing at Facebook, um, working um, and doing that with Netflix. So cool. So after moving back to Ohio uh, last year in 2019, uh, again, I was really happy at Netflix. I love the product. Um, I love the company. Um, but I, things have changed a lot in the time that I was gone from Ohio to California. And one of the things I wanted to do was just see what, you know, get the pulse of the, the community. Things have changed a lot in terms of startups, in terms of, uh, you know, conferences like this. They've grown crazy like, in a crazy amount. And I just wanted to see what people were working on. And so I met with a bunch of different folks, coffee and lunch. And I ended up meeting the co-founder and CEO, Matthew Benson at Ethos. Um, he explained to me 
um, you know, kind of the mission of what they're trying to do. Um, and I ended up making the move from Netflix to join eFuse last year um, as the chief technology officer. So just to give you a really brief introduction to what they do, um, there's over 160 universities that either have varsity sports programs or are building collegiate esports teams. So just like Ohio State has varsity football, they also have uh, a varsity League of Legends team where students are getting full ride scholarships to play um, games uh, on, on a full ride. So um, what EFUSE is trying to do is help build that professional gaming resume to help find aspiring either professional players, collegiate players, or even, you know, people who are, are, are looking to, you know, you know, join a professional team, you know, help them, you know, build out their resume. And on the other side of it, we're working with um, college coaches, universities, and recruiters to help bring those opportunities to the industry, um, to the, the people on our platform. Um, we also have very much a, a community networking aspect of it as well. So um, all of that's based on Linux, Docker, um, ECS, Amazon. Um, so, but out of scope for the talk today. So um, this is going to be um, a slightly, a, a much higher level talk. Last year, I gave a talk, um, Advanced Site Reliability Engineering Networking. Um, it went very deep on the networking side. And um, this talk is going to be much more high level. And we're going to talk about how, kind of the origins of the internet um, and applying it to something that I assume everybody's pretty co uh, comfortable or familiar with is ordering packages on Amazon and how do those packages get delivered to your home. So um, this is um, you know, where we'll be spending um, the, the, the next bit of our time. Um, again, it is a lot higher level. If you're looking for a really deep TCP IP, you know, DNS related things, I definitely recommend going and looking at that talk last year or um, I've done a global uh, global load balancing talk as well um, while at Facebook. So let's um, assume that we're at Ohio State in the 70s or so. So you know, we're, we're here, we're, um, we're, we're working on research and you know, we're starting to build this local network um, around the campus. So you know, researchers and, and, and professors wanna share uh, information you know, between each other. So we build this local land, local area network. And everything's great, you know. Ohio State, you know, they're they're building this, you know, they're they're sharing research together, collaborating, and you know, overall life is pretty good. And at the same time, Indiana is doing the same thing, where you know, graduate students, professors, you know, they're all researching, collaborating, and you know, the 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 quality and the the, the speed at which they can do this research has really increased in a big way. So everything's great, but then all of a sudden, you know both Indiana and Ohio State want to, you know, share information together. So they both have this local area network, this LAN, and, but they want to figure out, like, how do we share this information without, you know, actually physically driving, you know, between the universities to, 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 to be able to do this. So this is where, um, what, what we're going to do is we're going to create this internet or the inter-network. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to actually physically run a cable between these two universities. We're going to put two routers on each side of them, and then they're going to be able to talk to each other. So this is awesome. So now these two really big institutions are going to be able to collaborate much quicker, you know, we'll do research together, and everything is great. So we've got this cable now, and it's just between these two, but now there's more universities that want to join this network. So, you know, and they're also, you know, they're, they're building their local network as well. So Illinois jumps on board and then they physically, you know, connect to the other networks. And then Ohio University joins and then they connect to this network. And then as you can kind of see, and as you kind of probably envision, the evolution of this um, is such that, you know, we have a big network of academic universities. And when people are looking at this from the outside, in particular, the service industry or, you know, the, the, the for-profit industries, they're like, wow, this is really amazing. We want to also, you know, collaborate with these universities and we can probably use this ourselves. We need to, you know, share information, you know, across our company, across our different, uh, you know, cities around the world. And then this is where the internet service provider is actually born. So, um, and then this is where, um, you know, let's just say Acmico and, and these different companies, they, instead of just connecting directly to, you know, these different universities, there's this internet service provider and we're just gonna say Spectrum, it wasn't Spectrum back then, but um, they're the ones that actually, you know, connect to this global internet network. Um, and then they sell that service to university, or sorry, to um, these corporations outside. And, you know, as you can kind of imagine, it just kept growing, you know, more ISPs became, came up, 
Um, obviously, you know, in the in the 90s, this became much more consumer based with uh, with dial up internet, et cetera. And this is just kind of how the internet grew and, and you know became what it is today. It is literally a bunch of inter of networks that are interconnected together with global routing tables to make sure the magic works um, on all the packets around uh, you know getting from destination uh, source to destination. So let's talk a little bit about the architecture of the internet. And first I'm going to talk about or show you a visualization of the interstate system. So this is, um, back in the 70s, um, Dwight Eisenhower uh, base, uh, put a, um, a mandate or a directive out that we need to you know, create this interstate system so that we can not only, um, not only for you know, defense and military purposes, um, which other big countries have you know, set precedent for in the past, but also to increase commerce and, you know, and, and allow people and goods to move more freely and more quickly throughout the United States. So um, this is um, approximately what the interstate system looks like today. Um, I'm sure you know, we're all very familiar with the ones around, uh, you know, around Columbus. So um, interestingly, um, let's look at the US internet system. So if we go look at a map of the cables that are physically laid in the ground, these fiber optic cables, this is a very high level um, view of what this actually looks like. So if we look at this compared to the interstate system, um, interestingly, it actually, the map doesn't look that much different. You know, the way cables are laid, you know, throughout the United States is very similar to that of which, you know, the interstate system is laid out. And again, there's a lot more cables than this throughout the internet, but this is just, a, again, a very high level of, of kind of what this looks like. So. Whenever you're, you know, hitting a website and you're, uh, you know, hitting that AWS region or that Google Cloud region or that Azure region, you are traversing these cables, you know, to get to your destination, wherever it is. So what is it that I actually did? Sorry, I, you guys might be able to see that. Sorry about that. Um, what is it that I actually did at Facebook and Netflix? So what I said was I, uh, sorry, speaker is a bit. Center camera. Sorry, guys. Um, hopefully, this is a little better. Um, so, what was it that I actually did at Facebook and Netflix? Um, again, I mentioned that our job was to make sure, no matter where you are in the world, wherever you are connected to the internet, photos and videos get delivered to you as quickly as possible. So, to kind of you know summarize this into a service that I believe everybody's probably familiar with is we effectively built ways for the internet. So again, taking a look at the U.S. interstate system, you know, this is just a, a global view of, you know, where the interstates actually, you know, live or you know are are cut through uh, the United States. And if we actually look at a map of ways, what Waze does is it shows you the traffic um, and the congestion and you know potentially any outages that are happening, you know, throughout the entire map of the you know interstate system as well as more locally as well. So looking at the Columbus, Columbus interstate system, you know, you have ways here and you can see in, you know, some places we have, um, you know, some congestion, you know, up here, uh, you know, there's some congestion down here. This is, you know, what Waze provides us is this real time kind of traffic information. And again, this is what we were doing at Facebook is we were building literally the map of the entire internet. And, you know, just like Waze is building maps of our entire road systems and, what Waze does is they map this out for you know cars traversing or you know traveling between you know 20 and 70 miles per hour. Um, at, at Facebook, what we were doing was building the same maps of the internet when packets are traveling approximately the speed of light. Which, when you really think about it and you, you kind of you know map around the world, it takes about um, I think 200 milliseconds for one packet at the speed of light theoretically to travel around the world. So it's actually kind of slow um, if you really think about it and if you have to travel, your packets have to travel long distances. So what Waze does for us in the interstate system or our roadway system is you know, it maps us to the closest you know, destination to where we want to go. So say you know, on 315, you know, there is an accident. Waze's job is to tell me what is the next fastest way now that this path is no longer valid what's you know what, what's the next best way to go so what it's going to do is it's going to take me to, to 70 to 270 and then you know around to to my home 
So let's say that there's another, you know, traffic accident or there's a lot of congestion on that route. Waze will take me, you know, a much longer route, you know, by distance, but it should take me there faster. And it, it knows hopefully that there won't be a ton of congestion and hopefully it won't add to the congestion as well. So let's apply that same thing to the US internet system. And we'll talk about, you know, this is like, these are the systems that we were building um, and we were making decisions. You know, we're building these new maps every single minute of the entire internet. So at any given point in time, there are these different paths on the internet that are broken. Um, the internet actually amazingly breaks all the time. Um, and there's lots of different ways in which the internet fibers can be cut. Um, just, you know, common maintenance, uh, you know, a backhoe where they didn't properly, you know, get them marked off or they, they cut too close to a wire and that fiber got cut. Um, you know, this happens again, pretty regularly and more regularly than us as most internet consumers would actually you know, think. Um, I've even see, seen a major website go down because someone in the middle of nowhere uh, in North Carolina cut a tree took down the wrong cable that was a major artery for internet for that particular company. And they basically took down uh, the site for uh, some period of time. And so it's really amazing um, that such like subtle things can have such huge impacts. And the fact that, you know, some of those aerial lines can actually you know, be a major, major part of, you know, some portion of the internet. Um, and I kind of mentioned this, you know, earlier as well is natural disasters are another big enemy to the internet. So, you know, obviously this is a, a, an image of a hurricane. And if you guys are, you know, using, you know, AWS, you know that one of the major regions is US East 1 in, Ash in, in, in Virginia. And, you know, it's very possible that one day that hur a hurricane will come through and take out that entire region. Like, I know Amazon's doing a lot of work to prevent that from happening, but it's very possible. And I'm confident one day that's actually going to happen. So um, in addition to hurricanes, other really big natural disasters that are pretty, um, can, can, can wreak havoc on the internet is tornadoes, you know, taking out, you know, some, you know, major aerial lines or even, you know, some in the ground, um, as well as earthquakes. You know, California has a lot of infrastructure as well. You know, US West 1 um, is based, uh, you know, in California. Um, and, you know, a, a big enough earthquake could take that completely out. Um, and also a lot of, a lot of, um, aerial, a lot of fiber comes into LA and even Seattle. So, um, you know, a lot of natural events can and will eventually cause a lot of issues on the internet. This is the same view um, looking at the global internet system. And again, this is pretty approximate, but it's really amazing that, you know, you can see like these really big places here, like Boston, it's a major ingress point for networking. LA, Miami is huge. Miami's, you know, they've had a lot of hurricanes lately. And, you know, this can be a really, this can, you know, cause a lot of issues, especially for South America. Um, that's where a lot of these, a lot of the internet comes in, you know, back to the United States. So it's really fascinating to see, you know, how, um, you know, the world is connected and how the internet is connected. So now that we kind of have an understanding of high level, the architecture of the internet, um, let's take a look at how that compares to physical good delivery versus digital goods. So, Let's assume that um, we're Amazon, um, and this is, you know, Amazon was started in the 90s. Uh, I believe that the story is Jeff Bezos was um, kind of ticked off that he couldn't find a particular book that he wanted in any of his local bookstores. So he decided to build an internet company um, to, to, to be able to deliver books to anybody in the United States, no matter where they were at. So let's assume that when they started, and this is probably pretty close to the truth, is they only had a warehouse in Seattle. So you know, let's say that, you know, they, they're they selling books to play people all around the United States. And as you can see, you know, they are probably, you know, mostly using trucks to, you know, to use the internet state system. Um, if you're in further regions of the world, you know, they have to use different hubs and it's going to take longer for that package to get to Boston versus if that package was, you know, going to someone in California. So um, you can just see that it's going to take longer, and especially if there are delays, you know, it could take, you know, quite a bit of time. So let's go ahead and look at what Netflix might look like if they, um, you know, they were just started and Reed Hastings says, hey, I want to deliver this video. Um, they probably just started in California and, you know, close to where headquarters is. And they wanted to deliver this video, you know, throughout the world, uh, sorry, throughout the United States to different, to, to, you know, to different consumers. So um, again, just as the interstate system, you know, can have outages at any point in time, 
And the further you are, the longer it's going to take to get there. Similarly, video delivery is the same way. You know, those packets still have to traverse, you know, you know, thousands of miles of, uh, of land to actually get there, as well as, you know, there's going to be outages at any point in time. Those packets need to be routed around. And the longer that packet is on a fiber, the more chance that it will be dropped at some point or there will be congestion or the more routers that it traverses, you know, you always want the, mo the minimum amount of time um, for that packet to be on the end. So, you know, kind of fast forward and, in, in, you know, Amazon became the behemoth it is, you know, they started selling a lot more things than just books. Um, but, you know, what they wanted to do is they really wanted to tighten the time that, you know, shipping, uh, you know, took. Right. They Amazon wanted to make it so that you didn't go to, you know, Walmart or Meyer or any or Best Buy, you know, to get that whatever that gadget or that thing that you wanted. They wanted to get it to you as quickly as possible. And similarly, Netflix had a similar kind of problem where, you know, they wanted to make sure videos were fast. They wanted to make sure they, they, they delivered at really high quality, no matter where you are in the United States. So these are actually two very different problems. Um, you know, if you think about one's very digital, one's very physical. But they both have the same limitations, distance. And this is how the internet kind of you know, evolved into um, to, to, uh, to, to, to be able to solve these types of problems. So again, let's look at that single Amazon Seattle warehouse. And then you know, when we look at this map, this is the US population density map from 2010. So um, as you can see, you know, the majority of the Amazon customers it are likely not going to be in Seattle. They're going to be in various parts of the country. So, you know, what they needed to do is figure out how do we actually deliver these packages really, really quickly to folks that are on the East Coast. So the way they actually solved this was with an interstate distribution network. So what they did was they strategically placed these different warehouse hubs all throughout the United States, overlaying that on top of that distribution map to make sure that no matter where you were, you know, within some percentile, you know, say like 90 some percent, 95, 98 percent of the, you know, of the, of the nation, that they could get it to you within about two days. You know, that's when that two day delivery, um, you know, thing started happening. Is they want like, where do we need to be to make this really fast such that, you know, we can deliver these packages. And you also need to think about the logistics network, making sure each of those things that are people are likely to buy are, you know, located in those different and warehouses. So it's fascinating, not only from a physical, um, you know, presence scale, but also the logistical work that, that went behind. How do they, how do they make this as effective as possible? So let's look at Netflix, you know, similarly, you know, Netflix is a California based company. The population density map, the people who are using Netflix is going to be nationwide. They're going to be all over the United States. So um, what they, they needed to solve the exact same problem. And what the way they did it was they created um, this platform called Netflix Open Connect, where they created these um, these these basically these really big servers that sat in internet exchanges all around the United States. So as you can see, um, this is um, a map of where you know many of these you know could be um, you know there's internet exchanges all around the U.S. and this allowed them much more quickly to deliver those videos. And also it really removes single points of failure too, right? You know, if, if for whatever reason, you know, California was somewhat cut off or there was major congestion, um, you know, all these bits were located much closer to users. And just a secret that all of these companies do, whether it's YouTube, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Netflix, whether it's Amazon, they want to get your packet off the internet as quickly as possible. The more time your packet traverses an internet service provider, the, long, the more likely it's going to fail. Um, so they want content to be as absolutely close to their consumers as possible to make them, to allow them to have the best possible experience. And when you think about photo and video delivery, these are, you know, these files are getting bigger and bigger, 4K, 8K, you know, they're, those bigger files, you know, they're not going to be able to traverse, you know, as, as long as uh, they're much more likely to, you know, to drop. So um, if we actually really look at it, I kind of simplified it there where um, I just showed you a couple different places where Netflix has caches. But if we really look at the United States, this is actually what it looks like. And there, I'll just be quite open. There's way more than this. This is, again, just, uh, just an example. But what they do is they actually will... Um, 
they will actually work with internet service providers all around the United States, and they will embed caches directly into their networks. Um, and this is not something that just Netflix does. This is something that all of these companies do. YouTube, Facebook, Amazon, and even the big CDN providers that you use, you know, Akamai, Cloudflare, Fastly, they're doing these things as well. And they've been doing it for a really, really long time. So um, similarly to what Netflix you know, has done here, um, Amazon also, if you look at their distribution network, they're actually distributed in this way. Um, and when we zoom into Columbus, we can see Columbus actually has a few different servers of, that actually contain almost the entire Netflix catalog, the US catalog right here in Columbus. So um, I don't know what your internet connectivity provider is today, but um, what I, I would be, what's cool to do is go to netflix.com, you know, watch that video pop up, and then you might see a, a, a little airport code there. And this is common across, you know, this isn't just Netflix, this is Facebook and YouTube too. You're gonna see an airport code, maybe CMH, maybe ORD, maybe IAD, you know, th those airport codes tell you where in the world or where airport code wise, your uh, content is actually being delivered. So there's a high probability, no matter who you're with, Spectrum Wow, um, that you will um, not have to even leave the vicinity of 270 to get that video. And um, I know this uh, from my time at Facebook, Ohio State even actually has a, a Facebook cache within their network. I was really, really excited. I actually worked on that team. I was super pumped um, when, when that happened. So hopefully internet's really, really fast. Uh, Facebook internet and Instagram at, uh, at Ohio State. So, you know, again, you know, what we did at these companies was we built, you know, these maps of the internet. And again, this is maps based on the internet of where these different caches, or in this case, the movie catalogs were in the world based on your actual network uh, location on the internet. So at any point in time, these caches could go down, maybe they go down for maintenance, maybe they go down because of a power outage, or as somebody in Slack says, you know, a lightning strike. Um, you know, we need to make sure that we are um, you know, doing that in a very same way. And this could even happen in the middle of watching a movie. So you need to be really smart, both on the client and the server side, to dynamically track to move that move that traffic um, such that that user or that consumer or that customer never sees that buffering like that's the evil of all platforms video and photo delivery side nobody wants to see that you know that spinning uh, spinning circle so similarly if we zoom in and look at warehouses in columbus these are there are actually five warehouses at least in columbus when i last look on looked on google maps so this is how you know, google or this is how amazon is able to um you know, do same day delivery this is how um, you know, you're able to get the, you know, Amazon Fresh, you know, to get those groceries delivered is because they've strategically placed these hubs in major metropolitan areas so that they can deliver things really, really quickly. I don't have a slide for it today, but you can even, you know, if you've ever in Amazon US East 2, we, uh, um, Columbus is also a big hub for data centers. So Facebook, Google, Amazon, um, maybe even Apple, they all use Columbus um, because for uh, you know, major internet um, data centers, because for a few reasons, one, um, relatively inexpensive, very good internet connectivity, and um, taxes aren't too terrible. So, um, you know, the Columbus is actually a really cool hub for tech um, when it comes to a lot of this stuff. So, um, kind of in closing, you know, I guess you know, the goal of this talk is to you know kind of help you next time you you know, hit buy on Amazon, um, just kind of maybe appreciate you know how quickly you know, that package is going to get to you. And, you know, when you go and select that option, you know, whether you're in a rural part of Ohio or whether you're in Columbus, Ohio, and how those options are going to change based on how quickly that, that is delivered to you. Um, and, you know, it's based on availability. It's based on where the warehouses are closest to us. Um, it's really fascinating the amount of technology and the physical distribution um, of the, of the uh, warehouse infrastructure. Um, and then also, you know, when you press play on your next Netflix video or, you know, you go to YouTube and watch that video, just kind of appreciate, you know, the, the work that was done behind that, that traffic engineering to make sure when you hit play, it knows where that video actually lives, where that, you know, YouTube video is cached, and then, you know, optimally, you know, sends you there so that it's really, really fast and of really, really great quality. So um, lastly, uh, I'll just, um, you know, want to say, I'm my um I, I've been really fortunate to have worked at you know some of these companies and 
um, you know, I was you know, back in 2012 when I, uh, you know, left Nationwide um, and, or when I was even working at Nationwide when I was in college, working at startups wasn't really even an afterthought for me. So, um, you know, it's, it's been really amazing to see in my almost seven years out in California, how much things have changed. And, and especially in the startup scene and the venture capital scene and really just technology companies in general. Um, it's, it was awesome to see and made me really excited to come back. And, you know, I wouldn't trade my time out there and especially at those companies for anything career-wise. But one thing I'm more confident in this in 2020 than I ever have been before is that no longer do you have to move to the coast, to the East Coast and West Coast to um, you build a great career in technology. And I think it's really easy for me to say that today with COVID, but there's videos of me saying that last year um, after moving back as well. Um, so I really do believe this. And you know, really that's one of my goals is to, uh, in, 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 in leaving these companies is I love Facebook. I love Netflix. Like I, they were really great companies, but I'm really excited to, to one is to spend my time and energy, you know, based here in Columbus and in building the community, the tech community here. Um, and also, and, and secondly, just building amazing, an amazing company. You know, I, I love a lot of things about those companies and I want to help build, you know, those, that next amazing engineering company, that amazing tech company, you know, right here in Columbus, Ohio. So um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. That was a quick uh, ending. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Wow, the scale of that is almost, to quote Princess Bride, inconceivable. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, we have a few questions if there's time. Yeah. Okay, let's see here. I'm trying to get to do stuff on my end. All righty. Uh, so yeah, it's it's really interesting that you mentioned League of Legends in your talk. I didn't think in an open source conference we would mention like League twice in 30 minutes. <laughs> and when you were mentioning like that you were going to say a political statement, I was just like, and then you just talked about, you know, <laughs> your editor. <laughs> um, so one of the questions we have is what causes packets to drop over long distances? That's kind of like a interesting origin question. Do you, do you know that one? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I imagine there could probably be this physics answer um, where, you know, over the longer something travels over a wire or a fiber optic network, the more noise and the more I'm not, you know, obviously I don't, I don't know these things, um, but yeah. the more likely it's going to, you know, drop. Right. Um, so, or the more likely there's going to be interference, I should say. And right. um, so that's just at the purely like at the cable level, right? And when you have cables literally strewn across the ocean, underneath the ocean, that's a really amazing YouTube video yeah. to watch. If one of those fibers get cut, like a, a ship comes and like cuts one of those, go look at a video watching how these ships go and repair those cables. It's fascinating. But that was actually the, one of the questions too, is like, is he going to talk about all those wires under the ocean and how if we actually are connected? <laughs> it's it's crazy yeah you have these 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 cables and they have like these repeaters every large distance but a lot of them um yeah. that, that even make the internet work and yeah and ships will drop an anchor cut one of those things and it's very expensive and it takes weeks to fix some of those things but it's fascinating and like that's literally one of the things that my team was building um at, at facebook was to simulate cutting one of those cables like removing oh. multiple terabits per second of capacity over a cable um so it's it's just really to, fascinating. Just to do like the stress tests and yeah, to see what happens. Make yeah. sure make sure our networking gear works properly. But um, just to add a little bit more to the 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 question of like how things drop is not only do you have cables you know connecting and you have the physics there, you also have routers. Um, you know, you know you have routing packet routing you know between each of these different places, deciding where it needs to go. You have you have you know does it send it out this this cable or this cable? You know multi pathing and in any of those cases, routers get congested. Um, they have to decide which packets to drop. And, you know, if you're, you know, it just happens and it happens all the time. Um, you know, it's a regular occurrence. And that's why we have amazing protocols like TCP, like yeah. transmission control protocol. Like its whole job is to, you know, make sure that it's not overloading, you know, the path that it's currently on to retransmit packets. Um, that's definitely, you should go check out the last year's talk if um, you're interested in that. But um, a lot of really cool stuff that, that makes the internet work. It's fascinating that all trickles down into us seeing that Netflix, like something went wrong, try again or whatever, that's, which doesn't that happen much. That <laughs> well, you're not personally responsible. Don't worry. Not anymore. Not anymore. 
did you have anything Vance I have a list so just let me know <laughs> um, I just wanted to say there was uh, a question that came up oh in yeah the, uh, Q and a uh, someone was asking if there are any suggestions on career directions for for new people that are entering the technology field oh, that's and, and and I'll say someone was impressed in the in the slack about the uh, you making it through the interview process at, at Facebook, apparently it's uh, pretty oh, challenging. Yeah. Hey, I'll say, I, I said it and I'll say it today. I don't know if I'd get through it again. You know, like sometimes you do well at interviews, sometimes you don't. And um, that was a common thing that, you know, like, I don't even know, I, I did hundreds of interviews there. And like, I don't know if I'd go and be able to pass it this time. But, um, <laughs> it, 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 and it goes for any company, you know, and it depends on interviewers you have. And But hopefully those those processes are reasonably calibrated so that, you know, that's why you have five interviews. It's not to like crush your soul. It's so that <laughs> they get enough signal about your abilities, you know, because some people are going to miss things. They're, you're going to, you might do terrible in the Linux one, but kill the networking. And like, that's why they're, they're structured the way they are. Um, and I've, again, I've done a lot of them and I, I think it's, there's, uh, well, anyway, it, it, I think it works reasonably well. Um, as far as career path, it's hard. Like, I can't tell you, like, it's so hard for me to say, just go build things like just go do what's interesting to you i went I, I i'm really fortunate like i went and like went to linux because i was so frustrated not frustrated yeah because i was frustrated with it like i was completely linux or windows at the time the terminal was so crazy to me and that's why i made this crazy decision like i must like pain where i was like i'm just gonna wipe all my windows systems go to linux and do it and a year later you know i was pretty solid i mean again I was much more comfortable in Linux. And this is when Linux was a lot harder, you know, back in 2006 as, as it is today. But, um, you know, as far as networking goes, I, I dropped out of CS 671 or whatever it was at Ohio State. I never even took a networking course, but I went and, you know, went to join a networking team. And that's what's really cool about like a company like Facebook is like I was a Linux and software Python person going and working in, going to a networking team. And like, so what was really, I was like working at this intersection between these different kind of disciplines. Um, like, I don't even know what I'm good at anymore. Like, I can talk a little bit about networking, a little bit about Linux, you know, some Python, but, um, you know, I, I, I'm so your official title is like, yeah, jack of all trades. Yeah, I, I'm very much a generalist and I love it too, because yeah. I can go and like, I, I just like learning and, and trying new things. Um, this is a really interesting question. How would Netflix survive without distributed networks? Like I've, I was trying to think about that myself because it's just like, I feel like a lot of these services came about because of the distributed nature of it, you know? Mm -hmm. it, it couldn't. And the thing <laughs> about these companies is they, there's no like, you know, when you talk about CDN providers like Akamai and Fastly and CloudFront, there's no CDN provider that could handle any of these companies. Like they're literally like building the internet and building internet capacity. Um, the amount of traffic that's going, you know, bet between these really local regional networks, you know, a CRAN um, in the in the networking space, like ISP space, is just phenomenal, and and like it just couldn't exist. Um, yeah. But that's what's amazing about you know their pivot from you know the DVD the, the delivery to this. Oh um, yeah, so and it's, it's kind of amazing. It's like the internet literally made this happen, and then now they're pushing the boundaries of the internet. Yeah, well, you are definitely pushing the boundaries of everything. My goodness, like the scale of that was amazing. Thank you so much for your time. I think it's we're moving right along here. Yeah, don't even absolutely. have time to show another Linux book. I was going <laughs> to grab <Yeah>. some. <laughs> um, yeah, I want to uh, throw things over to uh, Warner. He's going to be introducing our next speaker. So Warner, if you can, if you can come on the uh, session here. <laughs> 